afternoon. Thank you, Peter. Yes, everything here does spin off of computing, and I'm going to now give you a quick run-up about some interesting trends in computing, but the last two-thirds of the talk are going to be about my current passion, as Peter said, the amazing effects to so many industries of cars that drive themselves. But first, I want to give you some background from my history growing up on the Internet, and I'm old, unlike all the digital natives, and what I learned about what it is that makes a true exponential revolution. The revolutions we're predicting and that we've seen have some of these ingredients, and important lessons come from that. What were the secret ingredients of the Internet? Well, the first one was early adopters. Now, early adopters are basically stupid people with too much money, right? They'll, they'll go out and they'll buy the 5S of something. Right after they bought the 5, they're still under contract. But you have to love them. Their desire to be on the cutting edge gives that incentive for innovation to be funded, and that's tremendously useful. Now, it's also important to have open, hackable platforms. Now, you may say to yourself, I don't really want to reconfigure the kernel in my operating system. Most of you don't. But it's very important that there are other people living in their father's basements or innovating in small startups who have that ability because those people, without constraints, come up with the innovations which then move into your phones. And your phones, whether they're iPhone or whether they're Android or others, are actually based on the Linux and Unix operating systems that were open and hackable. You also need an insatiable market demand for not just incremental improvement. Moore's law is not really a law of nature. It's a law of marketing and demand, which was driven by Intel and Gordon Moore. And it was based on the idea, how many of you would buy a new computer that was 15% better than the computer you have now? Probably none of you. You all insist it'd be twice as good, twice as fast, twice as cheap. And because they know you will do that, they invest the billions of dollars in research and fabrication facilities that make the new generations of, trips, of chips. This has been important to drive Moore's law as much as the technology underneath it. A surprising innovation of the Internet, and I say in many ways the real invention of the Internet, was an accident, and it was its price contract. The way the Internet works is it has the illusion of being free. I pay for my line to the center of the network, you pay for your line to the center of the network, and we don't account for the difference in costs or for the individual packets. What that allows is innovation to take place without justifying it to the bean counters, without knowing what the financial justifications are. I apologize to all you bean counters in the room. There are probably a couple of you. You're wonderful people. <laughs> but your job is not to foster innovation. Your job is to control costs. But on the internet, you don't have to worry about costs when you're starting up. One of the first things on the internet that got people excited and thought it was fun was a camera focused at the fish tank on a company. And people could come from around the world and see these fish across the world. And had the network been of the old style, build by the bite, those people would have been called into the CFO's office in a week and said, why did I just get a huge bill so people can look at our fish? Shut that down. Shut down the origin of the webcam. Shut down early Google. Shut down early YouTube, at st uh, things at Stanford. Shut down early Facebook. All of these tools, because they could play in this environment that seems free, but it's not, that gave us that, that innovation. Now, the final important rule is something we call the stupid network. If you were around in the 80s, you may remember the phone companies selling something called the intelligent network, which is where this term came from. The intelligent network was the idea that you could go to the phone company and say, I want call forwarding, call waiting, sell that to me. And they did that on their own switch. And you had the same phone. You kept the same phone when you bought that service for them. By the way, if you did that, you're still paying every month some huge fee for that call forwarding service. Well. The stupid network idea was different. The stupid idea network said, put the innovation in the edges, in the phones, in the servers, in the web servers, in the laptops, in the computers. Don't make people ask permission from the network to innovate. If you wanted to innovate on the phone system, you had to be the phone company. You had to at least make a deal with them. And trust me, that's pretty hard. Instead, on the internet, anyone could innovate. Anyone could build anything. And if it was good, people went to it. And that generated this revolution. Now, tomorrow, we're going to have an exploration or the topic of Bitcoin, so I won't cover it much here today. But I will tell you one reason I'm excited about Bitcoin, and that is I see some of these same factors in them. A world where in contracts and in finance and in money, people can innovate without getting someone else's permission. They can just go in and build something cool, and if the world likes it, even if the regulators and the central banks hate it, they may still be able to pull it off. And that is the formula for this level of innovation. What we saw come in computing and the internet may come to money from this technology, and we're going to explore that a bunch tomorrow. 
I'm going to give you a very brief summary of some interesting techniques that Peter made reference to when it comes to networking and bandwidth. And we need networking at many levels, in the ground, in the air, in the room you're in, over short and long distances. Uh, at the Google X project where I was working on the car, they released a project called Google Loon, which is not ready yet. But this project is going to float balloons in the stratosphere, well above planes. And these balloons obviously can't control where they are, but they can control how high they are, and thus what wind stream they're in. And they're building complex algorithms so the balloons will space themselves as they drift across the continent. And then when they get to the edge of the continent, they'll find the fastest wind they can to go to the next continent. If they can keep those up for 100 days, and they haven't achieved that yet, they believe they can blanket the world with internet coverage. The 7 billion people in the world, only 2 of half billion of which have access, that will change. And those other billions will come on the network. And these revolutions will come to them as well. Uh, the other project that's related to that, both Facebook and Google have acquired companies that make solar-powered drone aircraft, which can fly indefinitely in the sun uh, above our, our, not quite as high as the balloons. And these also are being experimented with as a way to bring connectivity to people at a much lower cost than we've ever seen before, much lower than the satellites, which are the only way to get global connectivity. A very, very brief touch on the concept called the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is right now a marketing buzzword. I'm sorry for not getting you too excited about it. It's the confluence of three important trends, nonetheless. And those trends are that sensors, computation, and networking are all getting cheaper, they're all getting smaller, they're all getting lower power. And that's very important. So the Internet of Things is really thousands of different distinct apps, no one overarching theme here, but thousands of distinct apps using these confluences of technology and what it's going to mean. You've seen home automation as one place where people are looking at. Google went and spent $3 billion to buy this thermostat. That's a little high for a thermostat, but it tells you how interested people are in this. The biggest monetary value for the Internet of Things that people see right now comes from increasing the efficiency of the supply chain. Now, the supply chain is so sexy that this is the best clip art I could find on the web <laughs> to represent the supply chain. But nonetheless, a few percent increase in efficiency in the supply chain means actually huge amounts of money, so that's got people excited. But now let me get into the, what I believe is the exciting part, my most recent passion. It is the marriage of computers and cars. It is transportation becoming a digital technology, as Peter pointed out at the beginning of our talk. When things become digitized, things change. I'm going to talk to you about five pillars of the world that change, and also a surprising number of sectors and industries that are going to be almost entirely rewritten. The most important component is saving lives, but there are huge consequences for energy, for land and use in our cities and congestion, and for retail and delivery. Saving lives should be enough for anyone. In fact, it turns out that we can do this because people are not very good drivers. In the United States, every year, human beings kill 33,000 people and injure millions more. That is, more people have died in car accidents than in all the wars of the history of the United States. It is the World Trade Center falling down every month. That's what car accidents are. 1.2 million people around the world killed every year. NHTSA recently, about two weeks ago, did a study putting an $871 billion cost on car accidents. That is 29 cents a mile, which is much more than the gasoline in anything but a Hummer. You are spending more for your share of accidents than you are for the fuel in your car. And Americans spend 50 billion hours doing this. To put that in context, Americans work 240 billion hours. That's the entire productive work time of the entire country. Now, we can save lives because 40% of those fatalities come from drinking, and robots very rarely drink. In addition, <laughs> they also don't stop looking, and 80% of accidents are caused by someone just not looking. Now, we have also given over so much of our lives and cities to cars, it amazes me. Los Angeles, it is predicted, has over 60%, close to 60% of its land as parking lots, driveways, garages, roads, land that belongs to the car. And 25% of all of our energy goes to personal transportation, 25% of our greenhouse gases. And to amaze yourselves, as a planet, we are driving every year 1.7 light years. How often do you get to use light years in your work if you're not an astronomer? I think that's pretty cool. But it's an immense number. Add us all up and we're going faster than the light. So take that, Star Trek. 
Why is this real now? Why is this science fiction thing come to us now? Well, Neil showed this garage. This is garage innovation finally taking place in garages. But it's not the AI he spoke to you of. It's not Hal. It's not Samantha from the movie Her. It's more something like artificial horse intelligence or even artificial bug intelligence, something that we can actually solve. So 10 years ago, the US military held a series of contests to build the first generation of vehicles. And the first contest was a total failure. Nobody got more than about uh, seven miles. Uh, my friend Anthony, he entered a motorcycle and forgot to turn it on. <laughs> but by the second contest, it had changed 18 months later, and five cars completed a 150-mile course through the desert, going down desert roads without much marking on them, going down steep, winding mountain ravines. All of this had been conquered in just 18 months since the first contest. Well, the winners of that contest were at Stanford, and Google decided to hire those winners, as well as the winners of the second contest, which did driving on city streets, to build the next generation of car. Here we see Chris Urmson, by the way, another Canadian. We'll see him coming up. Um, the chief engineer of that project, starting the vehicle as it drives through urban streets in Palo Alto, dealing with all the things you expect in a town, stopping at stoplights, making turns, and yielding, and so on. Uh, Google has uh, thanked these people for participating in their research. But not seeing the way a human being sees, not driving the way a human being drives. Seeing all the time in 360 degrees through the magic of more modern sensors. And so they took the car on a course through California, driving through the streets of San Francisco and dealing with all the things you might see there, ranging from joggers and stop signs to lights and traffic, going through the toll booths onto the Golden Gate Bridge, taking the road or car down the entire coast of California. Here you see the, the little town of Monterey sped up a little bit. Um, they've taken it on windy mountain roads, dealing with things that frankly frighten most people on windy mountain roads. It sees the same day or night, which turns out to be kind of handy sometimes. Uh, they even, for fun, took it down the windiest street in the world called Lombard Street in San Francisco. If you're a tourist, you've probably been to it. Again, sped up, don't do Lombard Street at this particular speed. <laughs> now, they've also been working on harder problems like merging onto busy freeways and other urban driving situations. The guys at Stanford, by the way, taught their car to park in a way I don't actually recommend you park. <laughs> now, you can actually buy a lot of these technologies today. There are cars that park themselves, that keep themselves in the lane, that will hit the brakes for you if you're about to hit a pedestrian or another car, keep themselves a fixed distance. All that's in the showroom today. And all the car companies have been making announcements. This is Audi's uh, thing that they've been showing at CES. Uh, when Google said they might have a car in 2017, Elon Musk, who has the largest testicles of anyone in Silicon Valley, <laughs> said that he would have a car in 2016. A Volvo has got in 2017, they're going to have 100 cars on the road there. Nissan has opened a lab across from us at Singular University and promised they will sell cars in 2020. But two days ago, Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of Renault Nissan, said he thought he could move that up by two years to 2018. His balls are just a little bit smaller than Elon's. <laughs> Mercedes not only has promised they will sell cars in 2020, but they have also got for sale today, and you can buy, or most of you, your boss can buy, a 2014 Mercedes S-Class that will drive itself in a traffic jam. Uh, you have to keep watching it, but this is a car for sale in the showrooms today. This car comes from the high-tech nation of France, and it is... Now, that's rude of you to laugh at that. It has no steering wheel, no controls. It is a shuttle, and you can buy it today. It is a car that is for sale today, being used on campuses to move people around. Now, Google has, of course, been the leader. Their cars have now gone about 700,000 miles on ordinary city streets. Uh, a couple of years ago, they made a video showing how it would be like to use it to run errands. I'll show you a few minutes of that. Auto driving. Here we go. Well past the blind. So 
So as you can see, Steve, the director of the Santa Clara Valley Blind Center, shows that the vehicle also provides freedom and mobility to millions of people who don't have it today because of disabilities. And I mean all of you, by the way, as you get older and your parents not too long from now. You will not lose that freedom because this technology is going to be there. Two weeks ago, Google unveiled this new vehicle, which looks to many people silly, and that's exactly why it's disruptive. It's not threatening to people on the street, and nor is it threatening to the big automakers. But this vehicle has no controls in it at all. No steering wheel, no pedals, no gas. Here's another very quick video of it in operation. So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time hanging out with my kids or helping them with their homework, even just tending to them, finding out how their day was and not having to wait till you get home and have dinner and all that. So. so you see that vehicle driving without anyone in it at all, delivering itself unmanned. I saw all these numbers together and these technologies as a sign that programmers can save the world. Let me dive for a little bit into how the technology works. On top of the vehicles, you saw this spinning sensor today, very expensive research sensor, but soon to be cheap. This is called a LIDAR. It's a light radar. It sends out pulses of light, which tell you exactly how far apart or how far away all the things in your environment are. It's true 3D vision, not the fake 3D that we construct with our eyes. There is uh, basically a view, as you can see, of a cloud of points. And so the car sees all the other cars, the trees, the rocks, the curbs, the lines, all of these things in three dimensions, giving it this ability to know there are things out there and not hit them even ne without necessarily being able to identify them, because computers are not as smart as human beings at doing that. There's also radar on the vehicle, which sees further and sees through fog, which is very nice. There's a GPS, but it doesn't drive with the GPS any more than you do, although I have seen people who seem to be doing that. It just tells the car what street it's on. So all that goes together to make a vision of a new sort of vehicle, a vehicle that you pick up a mobile phone, you summon it, and it comes to you very quickly. And inside is a desk or a, or a screen or face-to-face -face seats to have a conversation a place where you can conduct the productive work of your day, so transportation takes none of your time. All of this happening without any changes to the infrastructure, without building new roads, without making the roads smart. Like the internet, we make the cars smart and not the roads. This has four big consequences. I told you about one, driving people around, but the ability to deliver vehicles is also very important. The ability of vehicles to charge or refuel themselves is important. And finally, the ability of vehicles to store or what we used to call park themselves. This has big consequences for energy. Today, when people buy cars, they ask one question as they walk in the showroom. What car do I need for my life? What's the car that if I ski twice a year, I need to have this SUV? Or I buy the number one selling car in America, the Ford F-150 pickup truck. Or everyone buys the five passenger sedan. But in this world of mobility on demand, the fundamental question of the transportation industry changes. It becomes, what car do I need today? What car do I need for this trip? And the answer to that is very different. It's the kind of car they can't sell today, the very small car, the city car, the very efficient three-wheeled one-person car. Cars you cannot sell suddenly become the ideal vehicle for most trips, because most trips you're alone. I know it's very lonely, but you're alone and you're not going very far. That's the reality of car transportation. These vehicles are so efficient that they use less energy not just than today's cars, but than the New York subway. And not just more less than the New York subway, less than the Japanese trains. That's how efficient personal transportation can be in this vision. We can also have different kinds of power behind the vehicles. We can have electric cars or other fuels, because gasoline's 100-year head start is erased by this technology. Robots don't care about how convenient it is to refuel. They don't care about anything. They're robots. That would mean, if the United States switched to it, by the way, that the U US would reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 200 million tons and no longer need to import oil from overseas. Now, America has a very pesky habit of starting wars over the oil that it imports from overseas, and it would be nice to break it of that habit. I also want to talk to you about one of the other big sectors that's going to change. I and mean, I've told you the transportation sector is going to be rewritten. That's a $2 trillion industry in the United States, ground transportation. I've told you that the energy sector is going to be rewritten as well. But real estate is going to change, too, because everyone knows the joke about the three most important things about real estate, right? Their location, location, location. Well, the meaning of location changes when transportation becomes a Moore's Law computerized thing. And so commuting becomes easier, driving becomes productive. It changes things entirely. 
One mile away is now the same as steps away. You know, every real estate ad tells you it steps away from whatever the cool street is. That will change, and the value of all that real estate is going to change. And children are going to become mobile. Today, people choose their real estate. Basically, they change when they have children. They want to live in the city. When they don't have children, as soon as they have them, they want big houses, yards, schools, and so on, and they move to the suburbs. And the car created the suburbs, and this car is going to create new urban forms. Now, there are policy issues. Uh, while I first thought that governments would try and stop this technology, the reality has been the reverse. Governments are lining up to say, can we be the one where you develop this? Nevada's first license plate on a Google car there. Five other states have done this in the District of Columbia. Countries around the world are putting in laws. We're going to see jurisdictional competition. Singapore, China, India, they're all going to fight to be the home of the new automobile industry. And people will be lobbying for it. People who have kids who don't want to be taxi service. Drunks who want to get completely wasted and can make it home safely when they're done. Uh, and of course, uh, being part Jewish, I'll tell you that all of my friends are going to enjoy nothing more than arguing about whether it's legal to ride in a car like this on Saturday or not. <laughs> now, nothing's without downsides. We may find ourselves not walking much anymore. Uh, we may find ourselves not riding in little tiny green vehicles, but instead saying, I want um, an RV to follow me around. Actually, I want six RVs to follow me around and dock and form a house. It's not particularly green, but it is possible. And let's face it, these guys started it off, and they have other plans for the technology, not ones I'm in favor of, but ones that can't be stopped. There are also consequences to our privacy and to our freedom. You remember the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise? It said, pretends it's about psychics predicting crime, but it's really about self-driving cars. So in that movie, there's a scene where Tom Cruise is riding along, and suddenly his car says, you have a new destination. The new destination is the jail. Uh, and so the car take is trying to take him to jail. You wouldn't want your car to betray you like that, I think. But the police kind of would. And that's the kind of question our society is going to go over as that technology happens. And there are things that are going to get in the way. The cars are not going to be perfect. There are going to be accidents. There are going to be injuries. There may even be fatalities. And for whatever reason or not, people just don't like being killed by robots. And yes, it's supposed to be amusing. <laughs> They'd rather be killed by drunks, because that's what's happening now. As a society, we'll be making the choice between robots killing people and drunks killing people, and our fear of machines may make us make the wrong choice numerically, but for different emotional reasons. There are professions, uh, I won't name them, which may also get in the way of the technology, so nothing is perfect and nothing is guaranteed, as optimistic as I am. But getting back to the whole theme of Singular University, this is Moore's Law coming to transportation. Transportation is an industry which has not had Moore's Law. It gets twice as good every century if it's lucky. Now. The computer is going to be the most important part of the car. The car will be digitized, as Peter described. And the computer and the software in it will be improving on the curve of the internet and computers and Moore's law. And that makes a big difference, especially when you have computing, sorry, competing innovators fighting against each other as opposed to those 19th century approaches that transportation has planned for before. Remember our early adopters, the stupid people? If you have to bet them against municipal administrators who are not early adopters, I can tell you which one is going to win, which method is going to take over the world. The question is how fast. The car is seen as an industrial technology. The electric car is over a century old. That's a picture of an electric car from that long ago. It's taken that long for that to take over. But I think this is more a technology like the smartphone. 10 years ago, if you had a smartphone, it was a Palm Pilot. Now look what's in your pocket, a major supercomputer. I think we're going to see adoption of this much more like the smartphone than we did like the industrial technologies like electric cars. And even though the average car lasts 20 years, don't let that fool you into thinking that this will take 20 years to take over the world. It's going to be far less. Now, quick touch on some other things. As I mentioned, the vehicles don't have to park. They could wait in front of fire hydrants, driveways, pack themselves closely. My calculations suggest that we could actually get rid of most of the parking lots in the United States. Think of the bonanza of land that means. I told you about the value of real estate changing. There's also going to be a new bonanza, and we're going to turn some of these parking lots, in my dreams, into parkland. I know they'll mostly turn into condos, but <laughs> some of them will turn into parkland. It will be a bonanza for our cities of reuse and new uses of land, which is going to be quite interesting. We also want to point out, for those of you who work in the retail space, that in American society, there is one vital product, so vital that you absolutely must be able to get it within 30 minutes, no matter where you are, no matter what it is. Think about a world where you can get anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza, where you can get six pairs of shoes for, a, for a 50 cents delivery cost within 30 minutes and try them on and send back five. You know, 
small stores were scared of Walmart when it came around. Walmart needs to be scared of Amazon and Google uh, Shopping Express and the companies that will deliver with tiny delivery robots using this same technology. So it is time, I believe, for a resolve not too different from what we had in Apollo. And this nation should set itself the goal before this decade is out of a computer driving a man to lunch at noon and returning him safely to work. OK, not very good Kennedy impression. But, but Kennedy said one other very profound thing. Thank you. Some great things are worth doing, not just because they're easy, but because they're hard. This is not easy. There is real work. There is real innovation to be done here. But it is a tractable problem, and it's going to change the world. Thank you. Brad is, uh, always does an incredible job, and, and this time, JFK, light years, and cojones in the same presentation. I mean, it's <laughs> I'm very impressed. I, even better was when I said cojones, and, and I said, I don't, I don't know what the English word for that is, but it, <laughs> when I was in uh, Buenos Aires. So, <laughs> so um, one of the things that we talk about at SU and the Google car or autonomous cars, and like you said, every major manufacturer is, is, uh, is planning on it now, is the secondary and tertiary consequences, right? And no more. No more parking lots, no more driveways. You said, what, eight times the packing density or so of cars on our streets? I glossed over that, but yes, uh, we can actually get a lot more traffic down the infrastructure we already have without spending huge amounts of money as we plan to do right so now. So we talk to construction companies and say, what happens when your projections for new roads and streets actually head towards zero when you think they're going up like this? Because, so it's, um, is there one unintended consequence that you think is sort of like, sort of bigger and more powerful of, of autonomous cars? What, what are some of the, the biggest ones that you're most excited about? Well, I, I'm sorry I didn't list any. Uh, but I, th I think, actually, in many ways, the, um, the change to the family is going to be unexpected uh, because we, we transportation is so much of a part of our lives. I've got two three-year-old boys at home. They're never going to drive. They're they? probably never going to get a driver's license. But I often say that the purpose of a city is transportation. You live in a city because you want it to be a short trip to all the things in your life, your friends, the shops, your job, everything around, the cafes. You want that to be a short trip, and a short trip means transportation, whether it's by foot or whether it's in a vehicle. And if transportation is rewritten, so many aspects of our lives change. This is very physical. The internet changed our lives in so many ways, but still mostly by us being zombies staring at a rectangle all day. This is the very physical part of our lives that's going to be touched by computers in a way we didn't expect. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Templeton. Thank <laughs> you.